My guest today, George Seawolf, is one of the most sought after and celebrated directors of this or any other generation. He moves effortlessly between stage, screen, and television. He began his career off-Broadway with Paradise, The Colored Museum, and directing and adapting Spunk. He made his Broadway debut as both librettist and director with Jelly's Last Jam, the musical about Jelly Roll Morton starring Gregory Hines. Also on stage, he has directed such shows as Tony Kushner's groundbreaking masterpiece, Angels in America, Millennium Approaches, and Perestroika. He has collaborated with Savion Glover on Bring to Noise, Bring to Funk, <clears throat> oh yes, and Shuffle Along, or the Making of the Musical Sensation of 1921, starring Audra McDonald and Brian Stokes Mitchell. The Normal Heart, Top Dog, Underdog, Anna DeVere Smith's Twilight, Los Angeles, 1992. Elaine Stritch at Liberty, The Wild Party, Caroline or Change, once again with Tony Kushner, yes. The Tempest with Patrick Stewart. A Free Man of Color and Eugene O'Neill's dazzling production of his The Iceman Cometh, starring Denzel Washington. From 1993 to 2005, he was the producer and artistic director of the Public Theater New York Shakespeare Festival. He is the writer of the award-winning The Colored Museum, Shuffle Along, and Adapted Spunk. He directed and co-wrote the HBO film The Immortal Life of Henry Lax, starring Oprah Winfrey and Rose Byrne, as well as the award-winning Lackawanna Blues. He is the chief creative officer of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, and from 2009 to 2017, served on the President's Committee for the Arts and the Humanities. He is a recipient of just about every conceivable award given for the arts and was named a Library Lion by the New York Public Library and a Living Landmark by the New York Landmarks Conservancy. A Living Landmark. And now he is back on Broadway as the director of Taylor Mack's new play, Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus, starring Nathan Lane, Christine Nielsen, and Julie White. Please welcome George C. Wolf. Please, I haven't said anything yet. So, like, 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 no. and that's not even half of <laughs> your career, right? Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, welcome. You are back on Broadway as director of Taylor Mack's new play, Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus. How did this all come about for you? Uh, Scott Rudin said, I have a play for you in the middle of, of directing Iceman Cometh. And I went, I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> and... And, and so he said, have you read it, have you read it? I said, no, no, no. And then at the Tony Awards last year, at a party, I bumped into Nathan, and he says, I want to do this, and I want you to do this. And I said, okay, well, let me read it. And then I read it, and then I went, oh, this is going to be intense. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, I guess about a month or so later, I said yes. So that's sort of how it happened. And I, you know, and then I, I had a couple conversations with Taylor, you know, and we just started working on it in, I started working with Sandro Lacroix, the designer, in August, July, August, something like that. And then we did a workshop in October, and then we took some time off, and then we went into rehearsal in January. And, and here we are. And here we are, yes, exactly. See, what I love what they've done with Taylor Mac is you brought this wonderful downtown writer who didn't belong to stay downtown, you brought him up to Broadway. So I thought it was really wonderful for you to do. Well, Broadway is... Broadway ultimately is a series of buildings, yeah. and it's the passion, and it's the heart, yeah. and it's the artistry that makes it Broadway. It's just a bunch of buildings, yeah. you know, and sometimes those buildings do things that feel like, quote unquote, they belong, and sometimes those things do something like uh, the skin of our teeth, which feel like they don't belong, but they do, or Angels in America, like they don't belong, but they do. And noise, fuck, I remember there was this huge issue about duh. People were having a nervous <laughs> breakdown, bringing duh noise, what does that mean, what does that mean? And then it opened, you know, and then it's there. And then after it's there, it belongs. And that's one of the things that I love about it, that each year, the, the season, Redef the, the, the season redefines those buildings. And, 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 that's, th and that's thrilling to me. And, 
And so if a play is challenging and smart and engaging and, and questioning and says something about our world, even if it was written 400 years ago I, a la Shakespeare, or it was written two seconds ago, then, um, then it's, it's on Broadway. And, and one of the things that Nathan said, uh, which I really, really love, I'm going to paraphrase him and, and he'll tell me about it, but it's just sort of like, <laughs> you know, he said, you know, I feel like we've earned the right to risk. And, 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 and he viewed that as a kind of responsibility that, you know, it's like, you know, we, there are a series of hits that people have had. And when, and when you do that, instead of living inside of what you know, let's venture out into something you don't know. Because that's how you keep your muscles and your passion. And I think your, um, oh, it's, I, 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 if, if I feel like I know how to do something, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, if I feel like, how the hell? I remember at one point I was with, with angels. I said, how the hell do you direct a seven-hour play? <laughs> oh, my God. And I was, it was, I, I, was, I was like stuck. And then I went, oh, you do it like everything else, one scene at a time, yeah. you know? And so, but then if, 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 so then if there's the equation of the unknown, then I feel like I'm going to exercise muscles that I don't have and I'll continue to grow. And, and I think that's just very important because the other side, I think you have to protect yourself from bitterness. I think you have to, as a, if, you have, if you have any creative bone in your body, the most important thing is to protect yourself from bitterness. And the other thing is to also create this extraordinary, to protect as ferociously as you possibly can your sense of wonder and joy about the making of. Not the wonder and joy about the they love me and the yeah. victories and the great reviews and the awards, all of which are nice, but the sense of wonder about going into a room with hopefully smart, fun people and playing, and you've got to really protect that. And somehow, for me, the unknown is what opens up the door to wonder and joy. Wow. You've always had that, though, and you continue to have it. That's what I love about you. You always have that and have that wonderment. Well, because it's like it's, it's, it's otherwise, do, why do it? Yeah. You know, why do it? Why? It's, it's um, you know, I, I, I quote Tanya Pinkins, who quotes me, because I don't remember saying this. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, I don't remember saying this, but frequently whatever comes out of my mouth, once it's out, it's gone, and I have no idea that I said it. But she said that I said, brilliance exists in an idea that might not work. Oh, Isn't it good? I guess I said, I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe she said it, and then she indoctrinated me and convinced it in my head. But, it, you know, I love the idea that I said that, but if I didn't say it, I love the fact that somebody said it, you know? <laughs> That it's that that, it, that it's it's the not knowing. Yeah. It's 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 the not knowing that I think is very special, and I think it's really important to perpetually put yourself in that state. And then you're in previews, and they're watching uh, the play, not Gary, but any play, and the audience is looking at a pl at, at the play like dogs watching TV, I'm like. <laughs> What is this thing? And it's painful and it's awkward, but in that moment is also, oh, I know how to solve that. Oh, I know how to solve that. Oh, I know how to solve that. And so I think that's, that's the, the not knowing is, is awkward and painful, but it's where the fun lives because I say this all the time, an audience can tell when they're in the presence of a truth that was discovered just for them, and the audience can tell when you are recycling something that you learned on another show. They can smell yeah. it. They can smell it. They can smell when it's, it, when that moment when, oh, what about this? Yeah. They can tell when they're in the presence of that, and they can tell when they're in the presence of something that has a degree of casual calculation. You Beautifully know? put, that's great. Talk about working with Nathan Lane, Christine Nielsen, and Julie White. Because for some of you who don't know, there was an accident that happened with Andrea Martin. Uh, yes. She, if you would just tell sort of what happened with and where well, you the went. Well, last, the last week in, in the rehearsal room, 
uh, we had this extraordinarily flawless, brilliant, you should have been there, oh my God, redefined life, truth, and the American theater. <laughs> Final, you know, run through. And then that night, uh, Andrea went home and she fell and she broke four ribs yeah. in the bathtub. Yeah. And so, and so we're going into the theater, and she'd worked so hard, and everybody had worked so hard, and we we dug and we'd questioned and we'd challenged about this play, and 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 then we're moving into the theater at the time where you're supposed to be getting tech, and we're trying to figure out how to reblock the show so that she can do it, and and Nathan t taking on some of the task, but she was in pain and crying and ferociously determined to do it, and we were ferociously determined to figure it out. And then it became clear that we had to make this horrible decision, and, and so she stepped aside, and then Christine, who was playing Carol, the third oh. role, became Janice, and then Julie came in and, 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 and took over where Christine was, and they had a week of rehearsals <laughs> week. before the first preview. <laughs> You know, and, and, and Christine was going home and learning 20 pages a night. And then we'd come in the next day and then we'd block the show with those 20 pages. And it was just crazy. And it's a new play. And so instead of just focusing on the new play, we were focusing in on creating a protective environment, you know, for these two wonderful artists. And they were... You know, they were, they were astonishing. And Nathan's generosity yeah. and grace and protectiveness and heart that he shared toward them during this first, that first week and a half of previews was extraordinary. And, um, and what's fascinating about the three of them is that they are brilliant clowns extraordinarily brilliant clowns and 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 then very 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 smart very brilliantly crafted deep actors and 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 smart dramaturgically so 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 you're getting and and that combination is exhilarating and kind of rare I mean, you know, there, you, you can have a breathtaking actor who, you know, couldn't find a laugh with, like, searchlights. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you, <laughs> you know, and so there's someone who just has that yeah. extraordinary, the, the facility, there's no searching for it. It's there. And they're digging, and they're perpetually digging, and they're perpetually questioning. They're questioning themselves. They're questioning me. They're questioning the, the, the play. They're, they're engaging the audience, and, and, and they're incredibly very present. So it was, it, it, you know, it was exhilarating and fun, then it became scary, and then it became hard, and then it became exhilarating and fun again. And that's sort of the, the, the journey that it's gone on. If you haven't gone, you have got to see this show. <clears throat> I mean, just to watch those three comic geniuses and three of the finest actors work. It's, it's really, truly, really truly, wonderful. Truly. How did you find your way in? Because you're such a collaborator with not just the actors, but with everybody you work with. Santa Laquasto, lighting, all of the costumes, that all works together with you. This is so visually stunning to watch. What, was, what unlocked this for you? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I end up doing, interesting enough, Titus Andronicus was my favorite play in college. Okay. I, I love that, you know, because, it, you know, it's, I, I was an actor briefly, but I have too many control issues, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I was, I was, so, so I was, so I was an actor, yeah. and, you know, and in Titus Andronicus, there's Aaron the Moor, who is black, and then there's Othello, who's black. So I thought, okay, I could do those roles, and Aaron was fascinating me because he had no more remorse, and he was a villain. And Othello, it's a beautiful play, but, you know, uh, Iago is the role, you know. <laughs> and Othello gives it up over a handkerchief. And, you know, that's just not, it's like, you've got all the power yeah. over a handkerchief, really? You know, so that's not fun. So I really, so I love the villainry of Aaron, and I just, and, and I love some of the, I mean, it's, it's a black comedy, so I really, really love the play. Yeah. And it's a flawed play, but it's a messy play, and I, and, and, and I really liked it. So therefore then, it was, it was just challenging. I think the challenge was trying to figure out stylistically, because it's said in Rome, but they have Cockney accents and stuff. So I, was just, so I just started frequently, excuse me, I ingest, I, ing I try to ingest as much 
information as I possibly can. I, you know, I studied Joan Littlewood, and you yeah. know, and and so that was interesting to me. And 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 I and 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 I'd always loved Brecht, so I looked at some of that. So I was just trying to find find images and 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 and, 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 and impulses inside of it. And to me, it became a burlesque. To, it was it's a burlesque, and there's a. And there's a kind of degree of, and I mean this in, in an exalted way, there's a kind of vulgarity to yeah. it. And, and when something is that raw, that means there's something fragile on the other side of that. And so I was in, really intrigued by that dichotomy. And, um, and so we just started playing and, and figuring out what this room was with Santo and then figuring out these bodies because I wanted them to be ridiculous, and at the same time, so if you if they're lit one way, they're ridiculous, and if they're lit another way, you realize it's just all these bodies. And one of the things that I think is really extraordinary about what he's writing about yeah. is people in power create the brutality, and people without power are called upon to clean it up. And what you know, and, and what happens, and, and 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 what happens when people without, you know, there's a line, uh, how do you create hope when chaos permeates? And 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 that's what he's wrestling with. And I think that's what we're all wrestling with right now. We're just dealing with an incredibly not subtle degree of vulgarity going on, and it can render you numb, and it can render you overwhelmed because you're sitting there going, oh my God, I can't, and then another horrible thing. You go, oh my God, I don't, and then another thing, and, and that pile on can, there's a kind of spiritual inertia that can set in, and you yeah. just really have to passionately, rigorously fight to not let that happen, and so th that's what that's, that's what the play is about to me. A character prior to the play beginning has discovered that they have an, an agency that they didn't know they have. And through the course of the play, he empowers and indirectly empowers two other people to discover yeah. that. And so that, at the end of the day, you're looking for stylistic and how is this powerful and funny and silly and wonderful. And, but then also, ultimately, you're telling the story of people discovering that they have power and potency in a world that is full of chaos. And I went, that belongs, that, that story needs to be told. And also, I realized at one point that uh, it is Shakespearean just in the sense that a, a line of exquisite beauty can come right next to a series of fart jokes, yeah. and you and I and that and and that and that I that I is like that I love I love it I love so in essence the audience become they become like groundlings watching this thing so it so it just became and and also it was one of those projects where you th you figure out what it is. And then you go, no, I don't know what it is. And then you figure out what it is. You go, no, I don't know. And, you, and that process just keeps on going and going. And then it became very interesting to me to, to, um, to uh, figuring out, because I love, I use previews. I mean, I hate previews, but I love previews, <laughs> you know, because it's your, your final scene partner is yeah. there, the audience. And so you can learn, you just learn all of a sudden, they're there and they're saying, uh-uh, that ain't working. What the hell is that? That's not clear. What are you doing? They're, and they're, you know, individually, I don't care what they think. Yeah. I really don't care. But collectively, they are brilliant. An audience collectively is brilliant because they, they breathe as one, they're thinking, they're not, but it's somehow, it's very fascinating to me. And so I, it's, it becomes, I, I learn so much because all of a sudden the, the, the ultimate mirror is there. And, and so, I, you know, you, and so I use previews rigorously because why wouldn't you? 
you know, because now you get to, the piece gets to grow and you get to be, you, you, you get to become really smart. You're smart in the room making it, but then you have to, your intelligence and your savvy and your knowledge and your sensitivity have to become magnified. Yeah. And you have to do that naked because every, you have to be vulnerable to it. You can't protect yourself from it, you know. And, when, and, and so it becomes painful, but you have to be painful, but you have to be present because otherwise you're wasting it. Beautifully put, beautifully yeah. put. Take me back to the beginning, growing up in Frankfort, Connecticut. Kentucky. Kentucky, I'm sorry. Were there to work in Connecticut, so I could come to New York sooner. No, but <laughs> I, love, I love, I love, actually, I love the fact that I am from Frankfort, Kentucky. I didn't love it when I was there, but, uh, you know. <laughs> no, because we were talking about Connecticut upstairs. Mm -hmm. That's why that came mm -hmm. out, but Frankfort, Kentucky, where did your love for the arts begin, and what were your earliest creative outlets? Well, it was there in a way that I do not understand from the very beginning. Yeah. I, they did, Kentucky did some documentary on me and, they, and I went back and my cousins, it was interesting, control freak at the age of five. <laughs> but it was like, and we, yeah. when we would play house or something, my cousins told me, I would say, now you say this line, now you say this line. I was directing, <laughs> I was directing when I was yeah. five. You, it's interesting to me. And, and there's another story, which I don't, once again, these people tell these lies yeah. on me, but it's just sort of like, <laughs> I was visit, we were visiting relatives in Muncie, Indiana, and, um, and I was watching, and we had watched something on TV, and the program finished, and then they said, I think I was about four or five, and they said, George, did you like that? And I walked over to the TV. They, they say this, I don't remember this. And I pointed to the credits and said, my name's gonna be there. <laughs> Which is really yeah. strange. I don't, know that, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but they say that I said it. But it was, I, I went to uh, the school, Rosenwald School, which was part of Kentucky State University, which is uh, where everybody in my family had gone. I went one semester and I ran away because I need to get out of Frankfort, Kentucky. But um, and every year th we would put on the uh, school closing play and everybody would be involved in it. And I remember very specifically being, it, it, it's another kind of focus and energy and passion was released inside of me when that was happening. My mother was a teacher. She later became principal of the school and she would get all these uh, magazines, teaching magazines, and there would be plays and I would just read the plays. I would read, you know, plays that were for second grade and third grade. I was, I was obsessed with plays. And it's, I'm, Frankfurt is not exactly the cultural center of the world, but I was ob obsessed with plays and theater. And I would watch my, my mother, my mother would be so horrified when I would say this. I would watch like the Dick Van Dyke show because he worked in New York City and he lived nearby. Or I would watch that girl and she was struggling. That apartment and she's struggling. I don't know quite how that happened. Yeah. But, and I would like, and I went, oh, it's like, I wanted to, <laughs> this is, I wanted to have a big, I was obsessed with Walt Disney, so I wanted to have a yeah. giant amusement park. <laughs> and I knew that actors made a lot of money, okay? And so I decided I was gonna become an actor so I could make a lot of money so that I could build my giant amusement park. I still have the plans that I made for my amusement park when I was in second grade. And I would literally practice starving yeah. so that when I came to New York, <laughs> No, I remember, I would, I, you know, I was a very, I was a, this is true, this much is true. I was a very, very picky eater and I was always the last person to leave the table and I was always going, I would, I'm gonna finish and then leave. I wouldn't eat the food so I would like practice starving so I could come to New York and be a starving actor. I mean, you know, yeah. and then you come to New York and you realize you don't need to practice that. It's just sort of like, so, it was just always yeah. there in yeah. a way, and you know, and I, and you know, I would, you know, I remember watching Babes in Toyland, and I was obsessed with that and yeah. these films, and 
and then, and then I came to New and then my mother came to NYU to do some advanced degree work. And I was 12. And then I saw Hello, Dolly! with Pearl Bailey. And I saw yeah. West Side Story at the State Theater. And, then, and I saw a production yeah. of Hamlet put on by the Mobile Unit from the Shakespeare Festival that Joe Papp had directed with Cleavon Little. Oh. And so, yeah. and I realized in some respect, those three plays, seeing them when I was 12, sort of crystallized in, in some respect, a kind of aesthetic for me. The rawness, the rawness of, yeah. of, of, of the mobile unit, the perfect craftsmanship of Hello Dolly, and this sort of abstract, dark, perfect storytelling that was the directing and choreography of West Side Story. They were, it was, and I remember, I remember, I remember very specifically at West Side Story leaning in, yeah. and I wasn't leaning in enthralled. I was studying it. I didn't know that I was doing that, but when I look back on it, that's what I was doing. So, you know, 47 minutes later, after answering your question, um, <laughs> I don't know. There was all. There's just the, the m making stories, making stories, and making them, not being necessarily in them. I wasn't that interested in being in them. It was about making them. Yeah. That was always there, and in a way that I sort of don't understand. Yeah. You know? Well, three of your early shows began off Broadway in New York it was Paradise, followed by the Colored Museum, and of course, Spunk, for which you won a, an Obie Award. First time out. Listen to this. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, you, let's, let's not skip over Paradise, where I won nothing but bad reviews. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> From yeah. the bastards who are, you know, I mean, it was, you, it, 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 they, I, they were hate reviews. Were they? Evil, evil, evil. I mean, really awful. Yeah. I mean, really mean. Like, and one of them was, was the best, I didn't direct it, yeah. I, I wrote the book in the lyrics yeah. for it. The best directing the director could do is put a sign on the door saying, do not enter. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And then eight months later, the Colored Museum man, Hello, yeah. George. Where I mean, you know, it was like, like where you been? I was descending the <laughs> Harmonia Gardens Garden staircase in a red fucking dress, you know. <laughs> so seven months, yeah. I mean, you know, and it, it yeah. just uh, the brute. So seven yeah. months from yeah to ta da, <laughs> it was really, it was really fascinating and the best thing in the world that happened to yeah. me. You know, do I do this because I want to be patted on my head and say, good boy, or do I do this because I have stories I want to tell? And it was so valuable to get over, I mean, you always, sure. to get over that wanting approval stuff. I mean, you, you slip back into it sometimes. You know, I'm really convinced so much of, <laughs> we spend a lot of time recovering from high school. We spend the rest of our lives recovering from high school. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and so, but it was the brutality of those reviews yeah. was very painful, but I cultivated muscles of survival. You know, I think, and, and I think a crucial step of saying yes to yourself really is, is having other people say no to you. Because then you cultivate this, you cultivate a sense of your own, I mean, you, we, hopefully you, cult, you have some sense of, of your own sense of self-worth, but, but you know, it's like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm doing this because this is, you know, I think we all have, to, we all should be responsible citizens and this sure. is my gift. I, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm giving this to, when I make something, I'm hopefully empowering people. And so I need to be smart and tough so that I can continue to do that. And sometimes it's things that, with success, I have, you, you, you put padding on. Yeah. You put padding on. Mm -hmm. And then you become, can become numb to things. And, and that sometimes when you hit the wall or you encounter opposition or you hear a no, you have to get l mentally and emotionally lean again so that you can perpetually be present. 
and and I you know I don't wish horrible reviews on anybody, yeah. but there's a, there's a clarifying energy that I think is valuable that you find yourself inside of, and and that's how you remain hopefully smart and tough and ready to do the hard work that you need to do so you can put on work that will hopefully empower the people who come to see it. Beautiful. So, yeah, so yeah. that's just part of it. No, because that question you answered, I was like, how did those three shows shape you early on? And you just answered that yeah. so beautifully to have been torn down for the first, yeah. accolades for the second, and to yeah. win an OB for the third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I should have won an OB for the first, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> so it's the effect. You know, no, for the for Color Museum, I should, I really should have went over for Color Museum. Totally. Uh, you know, yes. I should have, yeah, yeah, please. They, yeah, they should have named us straight after me while we're going. Uh, no, no. <laughs> but you know, it's that, it is, and, 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 and it's, it's fascinating, it really is fascinating. And, you know, and, um, and then it started out at Crossroads Theater in New Jersey, and yes. then it came to the public, and I, you know, and you know, and I and, and I got to know Joe Pap oh. extraordinarily well, yeah. you know, and uh, and 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 then it went to the Mark Taper, and I got to know Gordon Davidson, and so there were these. I mean, there, I wouldn't call them. I, I I wouldn't call them protectors because I would. There were this these. And you should know if they were, it, I, there were these, it, like, uh, uh, Joe Papp, Gordon Davidson, there was this guy named C. Bernard Jackson, because after I graduated from college in, in Los Angeles, that, that gave me rooms to play. And they, I, and they would like, and I would go, I think I want to do this. And they go, go ahead. And it's, kind, I don't know kind of what it is, go ahead. And they just gave me, and I didn't have to, it say anything more than that. I'm working on this thing and it's kind of interesting and blah, 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 and they go, go play. Wow. And it's a really incredibly, you know, blessing. You know, P Peter Stone, the yeah. book writer, he, this will be in the book. Uh, because they, when I was at NYU, I was, at the, I was in the musical theater dramatic, dramatic writing program and there was a tremendous opposition for me in, at, at one point and Peter Stone was teaching a class yeah. and he said, I won't teach the class unless you, this student is in the class. And yeah. so there were this, you know, so there were these people who were incredibly generous to me and, 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 it, and they didn't have to be. And it was really, and it was, and it was really, really lovely and I feel very blessed for that. And, I, and that's happened throughout my career. There are people just have been, you know, who, who just, who, who gave me a place to play. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's the thing you know, that's the thing that you that you that young artists need more than any, anything is a sense of a place to play and discover and to not know, so you could figure out what you do know and what you don't know, so that you can grow. Yeah, I adored Peter Stone. What yeah. a gentleman! Yeah. what a perfect gentleman. Hey, I, I was quoting yeah. him while we were working on yeah. one of my favorite quotes that, of his. He said, "Frequently, when you work on a play, the patient lives and the doctors all die." <laughs> 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 that is that was just brilliant. Yeah. It was brilliant. So let's talk about being a director. Why did you become a director? You talked about you didn't really enjoy being an actor. And what are your principles of directing? Everybody loves being in your room. I've spoken to actors for the past, you know, 27 years I've been doing this. Everybody loves being in your room. Talk about that, your principles. Well, I, I started in college. I started as a set designer and an actor. Okay. And then I didn't like drafting, so I stopped the set design. And then <laughs> I focused on acting and directing. And I directed a couple of plays in high school, so that was always there. And then I started writing my last year of college. And um, I, the thing which, writing requires an extraordinary degree of isolation. And and I think probably ultimately, I think my most authentic self is a writer, but I also love, I love making community. Yeah. I love, I, 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 have, I think I have a skill set for, for, for making community and I, and I, and, uh, and so that's what directing is. Directing to me is crafting community and crafting a room where everybody is safe 
Phillips, once again, safe to not know. And I think there are two schools, fundamentally, I've, I've said this many times, there are two schools of directing you either stand where you are and demand actors come to, to you, or you go to where they are and you lure them toward where you want them to be. Yeah. I do the latter because what, what ends up happening is then they bring all of what they know, all of their secrets as human beings, then they bring those along. You can, you can kill, you can kill an actor's impulses. Yeah. You can do it on the first day and they spend the rest of the time rehearsal process recovering. They spend because they're, then they're protecting themselves. You know, I, I you know, w w w when I was working on Lucky Guy, uh, uh, there was an actor, P P P P Peter Garrity. He came and he said, I'm going to try something, George. And we was like, this is set in newsroom. And he brought in a duck whistle. And I go, Wah. and he came, he was just coming and he decided to do line, 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 whack, whack, whack. And I was going like, <laughs> That is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But I'm not going to tell him no. Yeah. I'm going to, he's going to realize this. <laughs> he will realize yeah. this is a crazy choice. You go on one week, whack, whack, whack. Rid me, rid me, whack, whack, whack. Peter's a brilliant, brilliant actor. And then at one point, yeah. third week, I went, give me the fucking duck whistle. Give it to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, he gave it to yeah. me and I walked away and the entire room yeah. started to laugh. He had another one and he pulled it out of his back pocket. <laughs> but if that's an yeah. example. You have to let yeah. act. My theory is if you don't let actors make mistakes, they will make those mistakes in performance. Oh, and yeah. you, and you, you've got to not know. And once again, this is the thing. I've got a right to not know and you've got a right to not know. And let's play. And, and there's a part of me that... that I found these notes that I, these drawings that I did for the Tempest of some of the visual effects, like six months after I had done the production and I had forgotten I had drawn those things. Because you, uh, for me, you do all this work, you do all this research, you ingest all this. If it's a period piece, I try to ingest as much as much, you know, about the popular culture, I'll read about, if it's something in the 20s, I'll read all the stuff about the 20s and I'll ingest it. So it's in my body and then you forget it and then you go into a room and then you start to play. And so I totally forgot about those drawings because you, then you're making yourself available to the moment the way the actors are. And uh, there, was, is, there was a director named Georgi Paro who was from former Yugoslavia who came to my college uh, and he gave, I'm, I'm an impossible person sometimes. He was a wonderful director and he was there directing production. I went to him and went, I don't think I'm learning anything from you. I feel like you have really infor major information and I'm not getting it. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I was just yeah. so close. He, and, and the next day, he, the next class he came in and he did this unbelievably brilliant, he, ex or, he explained theater. And he explained that the director acts, the director is the ideal audience until the real audience shows up. It was this series of very yeah. smart, just like almost like an owner's manual for the making of theater and an owner's manual for the making of directing. And then he gave me a copy of the notes to me after that class. And he was this very sweet, wonderful guy, but it was just sort of like explaining that, you know, that. That, that you are involved, your process is to g give actors information back about their work, becoming an ideal audience because what you're in essence, you're building inside of an actor their own internal director. So that in performance, they are crafting organically a series of choices that you have collectively figured out in the room. So it's, I, it's, 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 um, it's a sense of, I try to create as much as I can, a sense of, um, of play. I ask a lot of questions so as to try to get actors to let go of what they think they know so that they can make themselves available once again to the unknown because in the unknown, there's something more dangerous and interesting that's underneath and also so just to, and also 
one of the things, if you cast it really well, if you cast a show really well and they're smart people, anybody in the room has an answer. Yeah. I don't, I, I am, I don't, uh, I don't have to have all of the answers. Somebody can say, what about this? And if it's smart, yes, you know. You know, if it's not smart, we'll try it, but I don't know. But then it's just, you just have to, it's, it's, it's a collaboration, or as Robin Wagner used to say, yeah. he said, a collaboration is a word directors invented to make everybody feel good about obeying them. <laughs> 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 Which I love, you know what I mean? So, and so it's, and that. it's probably a little bit true, but, um, <laughs> You know, so it's it's just you you I I love I love I love work I love working with actors. Yeah. You know, you know I I do because they're fascinating. I couldn't do I you know, I could do I could put in a brilliant performance for one show and then can I go home? Do I have to do this again tomorrow night? Yeah. I'm in awe of the peop of those people that those people who can go out there every single night make themselves available to the moment. I, it's, I'm, in awe of, I'm in awe of that the bravery and the nakedness of it all and the craftsmanship of it all. So I love playing with them. I just love playing with them. I don't, I don't, people act just like children. It's, no, no, no. They're damaged, but they're not like children, you know? <laughs> we all are damaged, but we're, you know, but they're not children. That's, I hate yeah. that with the actors are like children. I hate that. No, they're not. No, no. Beautifully put. Which now takes us to some of the great works that you have created and directed. So you made your Broadway debut as both librettist and director for the musical Jelly's Last Jam. Yeah. I vividly ha can watch this show play in my mind. Favorite memories of that musical? Um, favorite memories? Uh, I can name a lot of scary memories about that. <laughs> that was a hard yeah. show. Yeah. That was a really hard show. Uh, this was back in the days prior to message boards and all of that. Yeah. Susan Birkenhead, who's a brilliant yeah. lyricist, reminded me, which I did not remember, probably because, you know, you know, you numb yourself to the pain. I put in almost like an entirely new act too during the course of previews. Yeah. I didn't, because I didn't know I was dumb and, and eager and I want to make this thing work. And, 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 and I was not, I didn't, you know, I didn't think that I, I didn't think about protecting myself. I just went, we're here. I've got a brilliant cast of people. Oh, that's not working. We got to change that number. Oh, that number's not clear. Oh, we got to change it. And so I just jumped in and it was prior to that time. I mean, before people writing about it. I remember somebody sent me a telegram sitting it to the Virginia now, the August Wilson Theater. Dear Mr. Wolf, don't let your ego destroy this show. I went, oh wow. my God, this is like, but it was, the, it was yeah. you know, word that they had to send telegrams instead of chat boards, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so at least they have to pay some money for this stuff. But anyway, um, but you know, you just, it was, that was, it was rigorous and yeah. there were, it was, it was rigorous and hard and uh, Gregory and I had a very intense work creative relationship. Very intense, very intense. And did I say very intense? And, um, and I loved him and he loved me, but it, it was there because it was, it was playing a character who was not likable, yeah. which meant I needed somebody with extraordinary charm and charisma so that when the character turned emotionally down in a dark alley, the audience would follow him. And I think it, we had different sets of information. And to me, I think it was a very, very, very prized collaboration for me because there was information he had that I didn't have, and the information that I had that he didn't have. And so therefore, in the wrestling match of figuring it out, something better than the both of us emerged. And that was, it wasn't always easy, yeah. but, it, but it, it kept on happening and happening until we found ourselves on the other side of it, and then 
you know, and he put in a dazzling, unbelievable performance. And, and so, and, and it was also my first time working with Savion, who yeah. I think was an embryo when he started working on that show. Uh -huh. He was so young. And, uh, and that company, and I, I think my favorite memory is that company was physically just stunning. Yeah. So that aside. But they, they, they brought such heart yeah. to it and such care and such love. And I loved, I loved them. I loved them so much. I really did. Yeah. Well, you got one of the most brilliant performances <clears throat> out of Gregory Hines. It was extraordinary. Everybody it was extraordinary. Saved on, and the replacements that went into that show. Brian Stokes Mitchell. Yeah. Felicia Rashad. I know. I know. Not shabby, huh? <laughs> no, exactly. Not the George C. E Wolf show. Exactly. Well, you were the artistic director and producer at the Public Theater from, was it 1993 to 2005? Yeah, around the time. I think it was around the time that I was working on, uh, around the time I was working on Angels. I got, you know, I was like, <laughs> can you come back? I'm busy now with yeah. a seven-hour show. No, like some around that time is where, yeah, it's around that time. So what are you the proudest of artistically for those years of the public? That, that I did what was done for me. I gave rooms to people to play. Yeah. I, that I gave, that is the thing that I am most, most, I mean, you know, Noise Funk was great, Take Me, Take Me Out started there, you know, Tempest, all sorts oh. of things like that became, uh, you know, commercially visible, but the thing that I am most proud of is just giving people rooms, just go in there, what is it? Well, that sounds kind of interesting, see what it is, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, Mr. Rubin, Rubin yeah. Santiago Hudson, 100%. Kushner, Kushner said, I've written this thing. <laughs> this thing, uh, it's about my childhood, and uh, I don't know what it's going to turn into. And I work with this woman named Janine on this other project, and she came, and then she came down and we talked and she said, I need some money. I said, here's some money, here's a room. And they went off and they worked on it and it was Carolina Change. It was just, wow. you know, it was yeah. just sort of like, you know, they worked on act one and then we, we presented it and then they went away and then we worked on act two. And it was just like, you know, yeah. I remember the first time we did a reading of Carolina Change, it was in the thing called New Work Now yeah. and there was, just the text, and there was no music, and Anne Ducanet oh. and Chuck Cooper yeah. made up in the reading, and they just started singing things while we were reading the play, and in, in, in front of an audience, and it was just this sense of, let's figure out what this is. That, what this is. So it was those, those moments, you know, and Irene Worth, and Irene Worth. Yeah. I, oh. Irene Worth lives in my heart lives completely we did up uh, i did i think we did about two or three pieces of hers and 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 i adored her and got to meet her and on, i celebrated her 80th birthday yeah. with her and it was just so it and then there would be these just there would be these moments of extraordinary uh i don't know where you where people people I think one of the greatest things that you can do for an audience is to give them a sense that they belong somewhere. And I think there were a number of people who felt like they belonged. Yeah. And so that was, that, that's, what I, that's what I wear more than the other stuff. Because you know, the interesting thing is, there's a question an audience member wrote for later on saying, someone who's just starting out, how do you get into the room? Where do you find a room? Where do you go when you're starting out now? Without Wait, any representation, if they don't have that, you, when that you go into a room with people who excite it and find somebody exactly like you, yeah. <laughs> who believes in the things that you believe in, but different, and and form these bonds and form yeah. these connections, and and one that will buoy you, while the stupid people don't realize how brilliant you are. You know, while, while, the, while the rest of the world is figuring out that you're gifted, form your own tribe, yep. form your own group of people who will feed you, who will challenge you, who will support you. 
and those chances are those people will keep working and you'll keep working and then you'll reconnect at different yes. phrases in your life. And I remember <laughs> they were so stupid, but I don't care. I'm <laughs> I, I just do stupid <laughs> shit sometimes. But anyway, um, I remember it was the year of nine. Yeah. And Frank Rich wrote a summary of the season. He said, last year, who but a few people knew that nine was going to happen. Each season, some I'm paraphrasing, each season, yeah. this, each season reveals itself. Who knows? Right now, on the Upper West Side, in a small apartment, there is a person who has a grand vision for the American theater, and nobody knows about him yet. I went, that's me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you look for these, yeah. you know, you look for these, and I went, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me, you know what I mean? And I put that thing out, and I cut it out, and I put it over my bulletin board while I'm sitting there writing in obscurity and poverty. Yeah. And so you, and so you find, get, put yourself in a room with the many people, it's interesting. I was, when I first moved to New York, I was teaching up at City College, and I was teaching at this place called the Richard Allen Cultural Center, and I was teaching at this place called the Children's Art Carnival, which was up on Hamilton Terrace, and I was running around just trying to make a living, and I was just doing this stuff, and then I went, all right, I don't have any time to write. So then I went to NYU, and I got into the musical theater program and the dramatic writing program, and I said, so I can just have time to write, and then I met Ira Weitzman, who connected me with Playwrights Horizons, and then I wrote this, and I wrote this play, Paradise, which was gonna be my big success, <laughs> ha ha, and then, and then I wrote this play that was yeah. just for me that nobody was gonna get called Colored Museum. And, and but interestingly enough, I, while I was doing the play of Playwrights Horizon, Lee Richardson, who later directed Color Museum, called me up and then said, oh, there are not a lot of black people who have been at <laughs> Playwrights Horizon. Do you, you have anything that I might want to read? I went, well, as a matter of fact, you. And that's well. So yeah. ultimately, you know, doors open up just while you're working. And I think just keep working. And I will never forget, I was at NYU at the time, and, and this woman, one of the teachers, she said, right now, you know, right now, your name comes up and it's one of a hundred. In five years, in two years, in three years, it's going to be one of 50. In a few more years, it's going to be one of 10. And you just have to just do the work while that process is happening. And, and what my big slogan, ultimately, about living, about New York and theater, but anything is, he who holds his breath longest wins. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't, don't, you can't, just don't, don't. You know what I mean? I, you know, don't, don't sing Old Man River. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> just do the work. Do the just work? don't, let, I get weary and sick of trying to hell with that. Just, you, you're allowed one or two minutes to feel that, then get back to work. Then get back to work. Do, do the work. That you know? was great. You know? Well, we have to talk about you directed Tony Kushner's groundbreaking masterpiece, Angels in America. Oh. I mean, were you scared of the play when you first got it? Well, I, 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 I there was no time. I did, <laughs> that was not part of my job description. <laughs> you know, direct the play and be scared. That was no, no time. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And you know, and you know, what's his face went on the Tony Awards and said, "It's a brilliant play." And then I ended up directing it. And, you, know, it you know, I got offered the play, and and I remember someone said to me, who shall remain nameless, he said, "Well, everybody knows the play is brilliant. Yeah. So if it doesn't work, it's your fault." Hi, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, but you, but the thing yeah. which was the hype around it was was so much that I felt as though my job was to protect. I felt one of yeah. my primary jobs was to protect the actors on part one, okay? And that was my job, fear. I didn't, that was not, I don't, you know, that's an indulgence. My primary job was to protect the actors in part one. On part two, my primary job was to protect Tony because I was given five acts like three days before we went into rehearsal. Oh. And through the course of that rehearsal process, I would say probably two thirds of that changed. And I just kept on, and, and the pressure was there because we had got, we, your producers, God knows, who are great and incredible, but I'm saying, you gotta write, you gotta protect, don't worry about that. I'll be, you know, I'll be Wonder Woman in front of you while you're over in the corner doing the writing. Don't you worry about that, I'll take the bullets. I'll take the bullets so, so that you could protect. Yeah. So he would feel safe 
you know, that was my job. My job was to protect the actors and then to protect Tony so that the work could get done. And so being scared or any of that other, yeah. that was not, blah, blah, blah. that was like, I, I couldn't, I, would not, I wasn't allowed that. So I just had to do the work. And also if you're focusing in on your job, all that other stuff just falls away because, yeah. you know, because you're doing this, you know, and, 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 and there would be days, you know, and there would be these extraordinary days where, you know, that there's a scene between Roy Coyne and Belize where Belize tells his vision of heaven. Yeah. And I will never forget the first day Tony came in and said, here, I wrote this thing. And, and, and Jeffrey Wright and Ron yeah. Liebman read it. And you're just going, oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I heard that first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to hear that before anybody else. And there were just those moments that would happen like that that were just that were just thrilling. And you know, and you know, I, I, once again, I love that group. It was a, it was a great group of actors. It really was. So, yeah. but it's so visual that those shows they're epic. And what unlocked the visual look for you with that with Angels? I don't I don't remember. I mean, just yeah. re I remember sitting in a room with Robin Wagner, and we uh. did it. And we, 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 we did a version of it, and then we went, no. And then we did a version of it, then we went, no. Then we did a version of it. I think we have five or six incarnations before we found it. I, in my, some, nobody would get it. I, my, Harry and Marge are my invisible people who come to see all my plays. They're just like <laughs> Harry and Marge. And, and you know, and uh, I've never met them, but they're there every show. <laughs> And, and, and to me, I, yeah. I, I wanted to create this structure. I, I, I had this image of this structure where the sins of America were stored. A, build, a Washington, D.C. building yeah. where the sins of America were stored. And, and that structure was, was, was in place for part one. And, then for, and Tony was adamant that part two be very different. And then in part two, that structure has been dismantled. And... Everybody talks about how perfect part one is, and it is, but I love part two because yeah. it's messier and it's, 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 it feels more like who we are as a country and who we are as people. And every single illusion that, that all these characters are wearing in part one have been shattered. And, and so I, I, I love, I, I, and also I felt like I, with part one, I was involved, I was, it was my job to deliver sacred text. And in part two, I felt like I was helping to massage it and, 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 and have it come, come alive. So I, I had more fun on, uh, on part two than I did on part one, just working on it. Because I, once again, I, I felt like I was inside the mess of the making. Love it. Did you fix the angel the afternoon the critics came? To, am I reading? I that read? is true. So tell everybody, one of the most incredible scenes in that show, right? Yeah. Tell a story. The critics were coming. No, it's like no, I just I worked yeah. through I worked through the I just yeah. I worked through the play in a very methodical way. And Tony Kushner was having a nervous breakdown, but that's <laughs> that's sort of not my fault. But it was, and um, and and so we yeah. we. Uh, but the first no, the first preview. Yeah. That's the the first preview we did. It. Jerome Robbins came to the first preview, which was like going, "What are you doing?" Just, uh, <laughs> tell, uh, you know, and. We came to the end, and yeah. Mary Klinger, she, I'm going to quote her on the stage manager, Pryor was there like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and you hear, open up the ceiling so the angel can come through. Because <laughs> 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 he's like, and then finally the angel, that was the first preview, cut to, just before the opening, yeah. I figured out music, all, everything to fit it all together, and I, that's when I got it, that's when I solved it. And it was just yeah. that I should have solved it earlier, but I didn't. I solved it when I solved it and stuff. So I had other things to do. So, it's just, <laughs> you know. Because you work in sequence. You work from the beginning in a show. It's, sometimes. Yeah. I, th I did that more so then. Yeah. And uh, I remember at one point I bumped into one of the guys on the crew a year later and said, we yeah. love working on your shows. And I went, oh, well, thank you. He said, yeah, because we end up getting so much overtime. <laughs> 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 I thought I was ready for this compliment yeah. about, yeah, right. That's yeah. a compliment and that's, from them, Exactly, right? exactly. You know, you talked about bringing the noise, bringing the funk. I mean, incredible ensemble. Let's hear it for that. Yeah. I mean, starring and choreographed by Savion Glover. Yeah. What was it like being back in the room with Savion? I was, it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful. I, 
I, I, knew, I knew I wanted to, I, it's like, it, it was so fascinating. I wanted to, I wanted, I was interested by find, exploring a relationship with history and rhythm. Actually, yeah. someone on the board took me to a Knicks game. And I realized, and I was like going, you know, I'm, I'm not an athlete. So, uh, but I was, I was unbelievably intrigued that from, from the beginning of the game to the end, it was nothing but rhythm. And, 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 and this rhythm controlled the audience. Um, up, you know, a basket would go, wow, and then da, 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 hey. Everything was rhythmic, the peaks and valleys where everything was rhythmically controlled. I went, I want to make a show wow. where an audience, the, where, the, where the audience is demanding the audience respond, where the rhythm is demanding the audience respond a certain way. I just, I wanted, I just want to play around with that. And then I, I, when, I, when, when I worked with Safia on, 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 on Jelly, I was just, it, it was interesting. And also when I started exploring on Jelly, it's, it's like, Ballet and all other forms of dance can be dramatic and, and, and sad and powerful and, and reveal complicated stories, but somehow tap is supposed to just be happy yeah. and joyful. And it is joyful, it's an extraordinary form, but I was really interested in seeing how it could be mined for intricate storytelling. And, and, and so we started playing and, I, and, and, and when we, we, we did a workshop, we started a workshop that summer in in uh, end of July, first of August, and there was just these file cards, and it was interesting. My mother was very ill at the time, yeah. and very very ill, and so the world didn't feel safe to me at all. So the only place, so that show was the only place that felt safe. And e nights, every night, I would dream numbers. I, I, and I didn't even know what they were connected to. I remember at one point I, I, I dreamed another where the, the, dr the drummers were playing the bottom of Savion's feet with their sticks. And, I, and that became this industrial number. And so I drew a thing and then it was like this factory. I said, go, go off and get as many of the names of slave ships as they have. And some people will go up to the Schomburg and do it. And, I, and then they come back and I put the, 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 the list in an order that seemed rhythmically interesting. And then Zane Mark and Andrew Kane will go into a room and they start wow. playing. And I said, Savion, I want to create a Charleston. I didn't even know what it was that feels like the world is about ready to end. And it was so there were these impulses where and then people would go off and play. So it was just like this giant factory. And we made that show. And the thing which is interesting, we worked off and on, I think probably for about five or six weeks. And every single number but one ended up in the show that wow. we discovered during that time. Then we took a month off and then we went into rehearsal and then it opened up that November. Yeah. It was created in this fever pitch of intensity. And it was it was one of the most it was it was the, 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 that show was one of the most joyful creative yeah. periods I've ever because it was every because everybody I had worked with Daryl Waters who was part of the music team but going back to Colored Museum at Crossroads and he had worked with Zane and then Savion and yeah. I had worked together and I directed Andrew Kane who was in Spunk so there was already this shorthand of not just of language but of trust and so everybody just played so it was it was a lovely thing. We have to talk about The Iceman Cometh. Gorgeous production with Denzel Washington and an incredible cast. Oh my God, ridiculous. They're extraordinary. They were extraordinary. They were e extraordinary. Epic show to work on, huge cast. Yeah, yeah, 19 people, yeah. And, For a uh, play. Yeah, yeah, and 857 hours, but no, but it's like, <laughs> but it was really interesting. It, it was, what, so what became really fascinating to me is that Eugene O'Neill, set Ice Man Cometh and Long Day's Journey into Night the same year. Yeah. Now that same year, <laughs> it became, and that same year, he tried to commit suicide. He decided to seriously become a writer. He went to Ar Argentina. He developed a venereal disease. He filed for divorce. He he just he went home and figured out mama was kind of like a little crack addict i'm being glib oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean but it was this tumultuous and 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 i'm going to be a writer and it was so it was this this churning year for him and it was fascinating to me that he said these extraordinary plays which he wrote much later during that year and and to me that that's what the plays 
became to me, that's what that production became to me of, of people wanting to numb themselves but vibrantly alive and, and nakedly alive. Instead of working through the numbness, they're reaching for the numbness as opposed to pushing through it. So that I wanted to try to find a, muscul a, a linguistic muscularity. And, um, and it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a really smart, hard-working group of people. What was fascinating was generally when I'm when generally when I'm giving notes, I don't know, I still haven't completely figured out why. Generally when I'm giving notes, I would I, I would give company notes. I was never give company notes. I go over and talk to this one for about 15 minutes, this one for about 30 minutes, this one for about five minutes, this one about I because they because I that, for, that was what was required and I really don't quite know why. But but after I did that, or not big after I did that, but I'm not taking credit for that. But there was but there was this incredibly cohesive company, yeah. and I and I think in large part because and I'd been like yeah 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 O'Neill's brilliant yeah 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 yeah. But once you get inside of it, it's a symphony, it's a linguistic symphony, and 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 the musicality of it. I. I when you read it, it's, it, it, that can elude you. But once you start to work on it, it's, you know, he's this brilliant writer, but he's also, he's a composer. And, and the, how the language dances and sings and flies was just extraordinary and, and transformational to me, just, yeah. in, transformation just in the sense that I got it. And, 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 I, and, I, and, and, and this extraordinary, and, 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 and the racial politics are incredibly sophisticated. And the female characters, while whores, have access to their rage. He gives, it, it's very, it's really, it was really, really startling to me how, how what a generous, what a generous, heart and writer he is. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get it for the longest time. You know what I mean? Until you worked on it. Until I worked on it, until I went inside of it. And then that, that became liberating and fun. Because I love everything you do, you go inside of. Well, like, how, no, but that's got to be the, the, the answer to like, you go inside. Well, yeah, because yeah. otherwise, it's just like you, otherwise, you, what are you doing? And how yeah. can you get people to trust you? If you're asking them to go out there and get naked, yeah. so you have to become naked to the material as well. Otherwise, they're, yeah, otherwise, you're, you're, otherwise, why would they follow you? Yeah. And why would they trust you? So, you, so you, you, you have to do your hard work and you have to make your, and I don't know, I, I, I just think that, I really believe that if you, that on every show you find a moment, and a moment is true, a moment that is true, and then you direct backwards from that and forward from that. In Jelly, I knew there was, I had this image of Jelly and Anita, his girlfriend in bed, and these three women pushing this bed around. I had that image from the very beginning, and, and that image remained. I remember going back to Joe Papp, I, I, I gave him a first draft of Jelly, and at the end of it, the character, this character, the chimney man, appeared and blew black dust in Jelly's face, an image that didn't happen in the piece. And, 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 and after he read it, Joe went, that's a really interesting, that's really interesting there. And about three months later, I went, I said, Joe, do you remember that character in the, in, in the script that I was working on? I said, you, the, the chimney man character? He said, yeah. I said, that's become my other main character. And he said, well, do you want to know why? <laughs> I was like, why, Joe? You know, he said, because in the draft that you had written, you hadn't found your voice in the piece. Yeah. That character became you, you know? Wow. And I went, oh, yeah. well, possibly, maybe. But that's <laughs> <laughs> we have to get into film. I mean, film directing, did you grasp it right away? Did I get it? Yeah. Well, yeah and no. I... I kept on having doing a theater to film dictionary. I remember I went like, oh, 
rehearse, because you rehearse for a finite amount of time, but yeah. rehearsals, editing is rehearsal. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, because in, in editing, you can build the nuances, get as much stuff as you possibly can, so you have it, so then you can play around and build, and build these nuances. So I, I had this, you know, theater to film dictionary that I was ro rolling around in my head, but also, you know, I, you know, when I did it, I never worked with Epatha, but you know, I, I called up Liev and I said, you're in my movie. I called up Jeffrey Wright, you're in my movie. So, <laughs> I, you know, I just called up the most Liev, you're in the movie. I just cornered out, you know, Marcus, the little kid, was in Carolina Change. So I just, all these people that I'd worked with over the past 10 years, I went, you're going to be in my first movie, okay? This is who you're playing. So, and they went, okay. So that was that. <laughs> so I was able to work with people where I felt very comfortable with, and it was fun, and also having... Ruben used to come in, yeah. for lack of water, Ruben used to come into my office and he would just tell me these stories and I would just literally go, stop talking, go write them down. And that's how that piece, they would come in and tell me, and this story, yeah. this, I said, go into a room and write them down because you need to do this as a one person show. And then he did it. And then later on, when HBO was doing it, he asked me to get involved. Wow. So that's how it happened. You had a great time working on Lackawanna Blues, right? Yes. Yeah, I did. It was, yeah, it was. I, I did have, a, I had a lot of fun. I had. I had, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were I you, tried yeah. earlier, I tried oh, earlier you? being a writer out there, and oh, yeah. you know, and you, you know, no, 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 so. Talk about the Richard Gere and Diane Lane movie you made. That was fun in North Carolina. I like being in North Carolina. Okay. It was, I just come back, <laughs> Yeah, that was fun, and I and I liked them, and <laughs> no, seriously, and uh, and North Carolina was really haunted to me, and I and, and that was really the material doesn't lend itself to haunted. Okay. I tried to find a haunted in it, but it it, it I found that it, I found it really haunted. And there are certain places in the South you just feel sure they're haunted. You know, and so that, that's, that's sort of what I wear with that, and I, you know. Beautiful. You also co-wrote and directed the HBO film The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, starring Oprah Winfrey, Rose Byrne, what an incredible cast. Renee Gold, you and Renee. Everybody, totally, I mean. Once again, I was gonna say, hello, you're gonna be in this movie. So, um, yeah, that was, that's, it's an extraordinary story. Yeah. It's an extraordinary story. Do you I know the story? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's unbelievable. It really is. And I and meeting and meeting her, meeting Henrietta Lacks's family, yeah. his children. It's it was it was that was that was really. I mean that that story, you know. And we filmed we, we filmed it mostly in Atlanta. Yeah. But then we filmed some scenes in Baltimore, particularly at Johns Hopkins. And 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 the th th thing that it's really fascinating to me is that the fa Henrietta Lacks's family lives maybe lived 10 minutes away from Johns Hopkins. Yeah. And so this woman's cells are transforming the world and 10 minutes away, they know nothing. They know nothing that it's happening. Yeah. It's really, it was, it, it was really, and, and, and they were very generous and they were very sweet and I loved, and, and, and the cast was really, Oprah and Rose were just, they're just, they're brilliant, brilliant, everybody putting in brilliant performances. Reg Caffey, yeah. God rest his soul. They were just, a, it yeah. was just sort of, it was a lot of, I had a lot of fun. It was, Atlanta was, you know, it's August, so it cooks your brain, but other than that. <laughs> No. See what I love about all your films that you do and your shows, you gave all these people their first jobs at the public theater, like Liev Schreiber, Anthony Mackie, Viola Davis, Jeffrey Wright, all these people George put in that room the first time. That must be so rewarding too when you look at what's happened to all of them. Yeah, it's, but it's, you know, I'm smart, so I, <laughs> you know, so I went like, that person's really good, come do a play. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, gentle ones, come, I will, no, I, you know, Liev, Liev comes into a room, yeah. you know, I mean, he, 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 I, he, I think he'd done a few other things, at, but yeah, but he's, he's, a, he's a brilliant actor, come do that, come work here. Yeah. 
come work, you know, Anthony Mackey was in, you know, was an understudy on top dog underdog. So it's like, it's just you, once again, people saw some, people saw me and said, here's a room. Yeah. And so I don't view it as, yeah, it's a good thing that they got the job, but I just feel like it was, I was smart enough to see how brilliant and gifted and extraordinary they were, but they were brilliant and gifted and extraordinary. I didn't make them brilliant and gifted and extraordinary, you know? But you so, saw it though, you saw it. Yeah, cause it's, you know, cause it's, um, once again, because it's, you, you're always looking, you're always, you're, you're always, talent, talent is, talent is loud. Talent, talent's not quiet, even if the talent is something subtle. It, if, if, you're, if you make yourself, you know, in, in auditions, you, you know, you can see it because it's there. It's not, yeah. talent is not quiet. How a person's mind works and, and, and that weird alchemy of, of heart and mind and craft when somebody has figured that out. And there, are tons of, and there are tons of people who have the talent but haven't figured out how to align it yet. They haven't figured out how to align it. And, and that's different, but for those people who, who come in, you know, I remember on Shuffle Along, yeah. you know, I went like, okay, now I'm gonna do these, this young girl, Florence Mills, and this other girl, and it's gonna be impossible to find somebody. And then Adrian Warren comes into the room. Yeah. And you go, well, that wasn't hard, you know. And now, and she's over there, you know, in, in Tina in yeah. London, and a huge, you know, and because it's like instantly, I didn't, you know, I didn't. She had been that had been in the pressure cooker of her being, yeah, you know. And and yeah, I saw it. I have an eye and all that sort of stuff. But that had been in her pressure cooker, and and so you see it, and you just go. I want that in a room. I want to see what that happens if it's given a chance to breathe. And, 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 that's, and that's what you do. I mean, that's, if you're smart, that's what you do, yeah. you know? And also, um, it's, you, it's, um, you, it's, it's, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'm, it's, it's not that it's just, it's it's exhilarating. There's an there's an exhilarating energy that people have when they're given the chance to be as magical as they know they are. Yeah. When 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 they when 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 you say hi, here's a space. You know, they there's a there's a joy. And a, and, a, and, a, and a monstrous appetite and a sense of play. And it's fun to be in the room while that's happening. And it's fun to put that magical energy inside of your work because an audience is gonna feel it. So yeah. it's, it's, it's great to see somebody come into their own. It's a really thrilling, fun thing. And you know, there are, I mean, there were, I, I you know, I was, you know, I was, I, I was very, very blessed. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled that my mother came to NYU to take these advanced degree uh, studies one summer, and so that therefore I'm, I'm at that theater leaning forward because it's feeding something inside of me that needed to be fed at that moment. And maybe if I hadn't, I don't know, I, I think I would have, wound up in New York anyway, but maybe, it, but there's, that moment was correct, you know, and I, I went to high school, it was very interesting, I went to high school, and I stuttered really intensely, I still do sometimes, and they decided I was stupid, because I stuttered, and I knew I was smart, and I knew that I was in the presence of judgment, I knew it, yeah. I didn't know it particularly, and and I sort of and I remember like Evita, by the time I leave this school, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I will run it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, 
And but actually, it was yeah. then theater. Yeah. I went, oh, okay, because you got to be a, you can't be a human being. You've got to be cute, or you got to be a yeah. jock, or you got to be this. Oh, I theater. I can be funny, and then that gave me my foothold in to then turn into Evita to then run the school. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so theater gave me my sense of power. Yeah. And 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 I tell this story all the time. Going back to my grade school. Um, my principal, Minnie J. Hitch, who was yeah. probably the first director, we were invited. My town was segregated for the first eight years of my life. And but this was after the second, and we were invited to a, a white PTA, and we were going to be singing. And there was a song called, We Truth, I don't, These Truths We Are, We Declaring That All Men Are the Same, That Liberty is a Torch Burning with a Steady Flame. And she told us that when we got to the line, That Liberty is a Torch Burning with a Steady Flame, if we commit to that line, we would shatter all racism in the room. And it's just such, it's uncanny that somebody told us, told me when I was 11 years, 10 or 11 years old, if I commit to language, I can change people. Yeah. That, that, I mean, you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous that somebody gave, let me believe that. To, gave me that information that I can do that. And so, and so that's, those things inform the work. Those things inform if you commit to Krishna's language, if you commit to Taylor Max language, if you get, put your heart inside of it, you will change people. I, I, someone told me that when I was 10. It's miraculous. It's a, it's a miraculous, and once again, an incredible blessing that someone said that to me when I was 10. And I'm and they, glad they did, because at 10, I believed it. If, I, if they had said it to me when I was 18, I went, like, well, I don't know about that. But at 10, I firmly believe it, and at this 857-year-old that I am now, I still do. You know, I Beautiful. still do. I really That's do. That's it. There's a question from the audience. Someone wrote, do you have a vision for each scene, either in film or on Broadway or when you're working on a script? Do you have a vision before you start? No. Okay. No, absolutely not. I, I, it's, I, no, things, things reveal. It's, it's, I call it dumb time. Okay. I call it dumb time. You work really hard. You read really hard. You, you study. You, you ingest as much information as you possibly can. And then you stop. And in that, what, in, in that dumb time, that's when it connects. Yeah. And, then Im and then images start to form and ideas that are, that are organic to you. You've after, it's like a blender. You mix it all up and then you let it settle. And then images will start to emerge for me or ideas and impulses. You know, that's sort of how I approach the work. Yeah. Someone wrote, with your wealth of knowledge about our business, what advice would you give to an actor, writer, producer producing her solo show in a run for the first time? Make sure you have other people's vision in the room. You know, watch the, you know, I, I, you know, acting, the acting and the writing is good. You, there needs to be another I. Yeah. There needs to be another eye in the room. Even if you wrote and directed, fine. But if you're acting, directing, and writing, no. You need, you need somebody to go, really? How about that? What about this? What about yeah. that? What about it? They don't have to, they don't have to be heavy, and if they're heavy-handed, then they shouldn't be in the room. You know, because that's one of when when you're doing one person shows as a director. You really don't exist. You have yeah. to be, you, you, you have to, your touch has to be very specific but very light. Because it's not really about you. It's about, you know, I work with Anna DeVere Smith and Elaine Stritch, two, oh my God, two, like, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on one person shows. They're hard. Yeah. Because you have to be completely selfless. You can't, you can't impose anything on it. You can help create structure, but you can't impose anything. You're in service, you're totally in service of. Got it. You've answered many of these other questions. My final question is, what is the best bit of advice that you've been given, either personally or professionally, that you live by? Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, 
my grandmother has a saying, which is just personally, yeah. about if you tell one lie, if you tell one lie, you're going to tell two. <laughs> which is brilliant. <laughs> so once you start those lies, yeah, yeah. you're not going to just tell one lie. You're going to tell. So careful when you start the lying, and um, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And um, the other, let me. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, there's one piece of advice that I can't say, but uh, <laughs> I can. It just stays here. No. Nah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> And all the people watching, yeah, or not. But um, uh, it, 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 it was just ferocious, it pr protect your joy. Protect your, protect your joy ferociously. Protect your joy. Don't let anyone. Mama, daddy, lover, you know, accountant, IRS. <laughs> Don't let anything contaminate your joy about, about the thing that you love. Because, you, because that's... You just can't, you don't do that. Don't let a bad review, don't let a horrible person you're working with, yeah. don't let any, you have to work really ferociously because if somebody takes away your joy, you have to be careful because then resentment can set in and then bitterness can set in. And bitterness eats talent. It eats it. It will yeah. eat I've seen it yeah. in people. It eats talent. Joy just makes you sad. Losing joy, but the sadness gives way to resentment, gives way to bitterness, and bitterness will eat it, will eat it. And your talent, I've worked with people who have they so much the rage. And and you know, you know, I'm a very angry boy too, but but I, I use anger as fuel. Yeah. But, but it's not, I make picture it doesn't, it does not get anywhere, anywhere near the joy of the doing or the making or the discovering. And I think that's, and, and, and I think that's, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the fuel. That's why, that's how, why you go into the room. That's why you, so that you get to, and that joy is that fuel that sees you through when you're tired and exhausted and you hate, everybody in the room, you know, and they hate you holding on to that joy, you know. That is beautiful. Thank you. I have to tell you. Thank you. I have known you since the Colored Museum, and I, I have spoken to you over the years with everything. I have wanted to sit with you for the longest time like this. This is beyond a master class. Thank you for everything you gave everybody oh, well, thank today. Thank you. Thank you so Ladies much. Ladies and gentlemen, George C. Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.